Chapter 12, The Treatise on the Love of God. In 1616, the Bishop of Grenoble invited Francis to preach a series of Advent sermons. Francis preached here in the cathedral as well as before the parliament in their chapel. Francis continued to strengthen his love for people. He tried to find grounds for understanding them, especially the Protestants. Several Protestants, including Duke Lediguerre, were present for his sermons. Lediguerre was one of the most celebrated captains of his time. He fought against the Catholics and the Duke of Savoy in Dauphiné, then in the Piedmont mountain ranges in Italy against the Spanish. This street in Paris is named after him. Later, Le Diguier talked with de Sales, telling him that he found what Francis had said to be good. The Duke had Francis preach again the next year. In 1622, Le Diguier became a Catholic. A pavilion or section of the Louvre is named after Duke Le Diguier. In 1617, during Lent, Francis again preached in Grenoble. The coadjutor of the diocese expressed the desire of having a monastery of the visitation in Grenoble. Today it is found high on a hillside overlooking the city. In 1616, in the midst of his apostolic works, Francis had the treatise on the love of God published by the Rigaud Press at Lyon, where the introduction to a devout life had been published. It was meant for those who had already made progress in devotion. We see here a first edition of the treatise on the love of God. In this copy, Francis had written a dedication to his friend, Humbert Vibert. Francis had taken seriously his role as bishop, as decreed by the Council of Trent, of instructing his flock, leading them toward a relationship with God. He would tell them that God had an unquenchable love for us, that he attracts, invites, and inspires us to that love. But he does not force us. He leaves us free to respond. He does not draw us with iron chains as one drags a bull or fiery horse, but by enticements and delightful attractions. God's grace is so gracious that it touches us powerfully but delicately, so that our free will is not forced but enticed. God's love presses us, but it does not oppress us. End of video 6. Produced by DeSales University. Directed and narrated by A. Robert McGilvray, Oblate of St. Francis de Sales. Video 7 Through some difficult times then back to Paris. In this video, we will follow Francis de Sales' experiences in Lyon, Annecy, Turin, Grenoble, Paris, and Tours. 
Chapter 13, To the Mercy of God. The institute that Jane and Francis founded began to grow beyond Annecy. They drew up a constitution. Lyon requested a monastery. Rome's approbation came in 1618, but included the provision that they become cloistered, as groups of sisters were expected to be in those days. This window from the Church of Saint Severin in Paris depicts Francis giving the rule to Jane and her followers. Francis and Jane accepted the approbation. They saw the actual visitation of the poor as good, but not essential to their institute. The sisters could be of service to the whole church by their lives of prayer and sacrifice. With the approbation, the sisters became cloistered. The poor of Annecy were disappointed. Yet in times of necessity, the sisters managed to be of service without leaving their monastery. For instance, in later years, when the plague struck Annecy, the sisters managed to send supplies to the poor and sick. Their charity would prove inventive. This window is from the chapel of the former Visitation Monastery in Tonon. Jane and Francis would have other heartaches. Francis' brother Bernard died of the plague in Piedmont, where he fought for the Duke of Savoy. Marie Aimé, Bernard's wife and Jane's daughter, died at the birth of a premature child. Jane had baptized her grandson before he died. This is an original portrait of Jane done in 1636. In better times, Francis had been very much a part of their lives. He had performed the marriage ceremony for Marie Aimé and Bernard. He had directed Marie Aimé in the spiritual life. Francis administered the sacrament of reconciliation and the Eucharist to her. This is an original portrait of Francis done in 1618. Back in Annecy, Marie May had often lived at the monastery while her husband was away. On her deathbed, she asked to become a visitandine. She received the sacrament of the sick, made the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and died at 2 a.m. Francis found it especially painful since Marie Aimé had lived among them. She was especially dear to them, but he said, We embrace and love and adore the will of God with total submission in our hearts. The strain of the death of family members and the challenges of his diocese had fatigued Francis. It had been especially difficult to call monasteries back to the observance of their rule such as the one at Taloir. One monastery that was never a problem for the bishop was the Grande Chartreuse, founded by St. Bruno in 1084, in the Alps, not far from Grenoble. When Francis preached at Grenoble in 1618, he stayed with the monks there for a short time. The building where the monks live can be seen at the center of this photo. A model in the visitor center gives us a better idea of the layout of their monastery. They lived a solitary life, only coming together at times. The visitor center shows a typical monk's quarters. He had his own workshop and garden. His sleeping quarters are attached, with an area for study and a kneeler for prayer. They would come together for the liturgy where singing played an important part in the celebration of the Mass and the chanting of the Psalms. The monastery of the Chartreuse provided some relaxation and prayerful quiet for Francis, but he would soon be pressed into further work. 